Hello, everybody. As Eric said, my name is Brian Clark. I'm an engineer with the construction lab out here at Champaign. And I'm going to start with a little bit about my story and how I got involved with this topic. So my story starts with this building, Khalil Hall. So Khalil Hall was a building at Presidio built about five years ago that, that should have been running very efficiently. It had efficient equipment. Uh, it had very high efficient lighting and HVAC equipment and HVAC controls. But what we were seeing from the billing data from the, the first uh, couple quarters of operation is that the performance was, was quite poor and it was getting worse. So we were seeing a 20% increase just since it had been commissioned. So we didn't really know how to approach this problem, but to make a long story short, what we were able to do is take the building performance that you see on the left in the first two and a half years and take it to what we now have in the most recent two and a half years. So I could talk a lot about what we did in that building to, to, to cause this change, and I'll be giving some examples. But the real story here is the process, and that process is called RCX. So RCX is short for retro commissioning or recommissioning, and it's all about optimizing the energy use in existing buildings. So it, it's a pretty powerful moment for me to be able to take control of a building like that and understand how it works and what needed to change to, uh, to, to really optimize the energy use. So it's, it's become a big focus for me, starting with a, a year-long workshop that I took through the, the local utility. Got involved in a number of RCX projects had written up some articles and was part of some uh, awards for the for the base and uh, had then been asked to help host some RCX practicums, webinars and get involved in some other levels of army support. So what I'm going to try to do today is convey how important RCX is, what some of the definitions are surrounding that, give you some examples of what it looks like in the field and then get you some exposure to some resources so you know where to go next if you want some more detail. So to start, there's a lot of terms up front that we could define. I think one that I'm going to call out here just to differentiate it from RCX is CX or commissioning. So a lot of folks might be familiar with the, uh, with the term commissioning or the UFGS on HVAC commissioning. And that's really a quality assurance process that is meant to compare building usage with what was in the contract documents. So not necessarily how to make the building operate as efficiently as it, as it can, given the, the de design conditions, but how to make sure that it's, it's meeting what's in the contract. And then by contrast, RCX is about trying to optimize the building energy usage against the occupied needs. So the terms recommissioning are typically used for a building that had undergone an initial commissioning and retro commissioning for a building that had not gone through a commissioning. But the process is the same, so we can conveniently use a blanket term like RCX. So how does it work? Well, as a, as a kind of simple analogy or example, I could, I could give you a picture of this car and ask, can you tell me how well this car operates? And it would be very hard from looking at it, you could, you could make some judgments based on the design of the car. I could give you some fuel costs or let you look under the hood and give you snapshots like that that might give you a clue as to the performance. But really, for engineered systems like this, there's a, there's a diagnostic analytical process to evaluate performance and then make changes. And it's really the same for our buildings. So for buildings, that process is known as, as RCX, but it's a, a similar level of effort of using different performance and testing techniques and data analysis to be able to understand how that building works and how it can work better. So, so why, why care? What's, what's, what's the importance here? Uh, well, one answer could be because there's a mandate to perform RCX assessments that's wrapped into the ESA 2007 uh, section that describes energy and water evaluations. So there's been some follow-on guidance there that recommends that the energy manager shall perform an initial RCX assessment that where it's deemed that there's economically viable candidates for a deeper investigation that that investigation is conducted. 
there's been some rule of thumbs that uh, <clears throat> 50,000 50, square foot and under might be exempt from this, uh, this level of effort unless there's energy intensive operations inside. And there's been some uh, language in the guiding principles that calls for certain deliver deliverables like RCX plans, reports, and measurement and verification. But it's been fairly limited. And uh, the RCX reporting end has been limited as well. This is a screenshot of what an Army energy manager inputs as part of the energy and water evaluation. And as a component of that, there's this one line item for retro recommissioning assessment. <clears throat> and right now, uh, it's, it's essentially a drop down window that just says no or yes if it's been completed. And as, a, as an added kind of feature, the AWERS reporting isn't marked complete unless you check yes. So I've suspected that this, th th this may affect uh, the, the quality of some of the RCX assessments that we're seeing. And um, it, from talking to some Army energy managers, this definitely seems to be a challenge that they're facing. But more than, than having to meet the mandate is, 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 is why we should. And I think when you look at what's in the recent executive order, um, what type of energy reductions we're now looking at for the next 10 years, looking forward to net zero energy, I, I can't see a way that, that RCX is not a component in those, in those goals. Another way to look at it is with the proverbial fruit. So how much of this low-hanging fruit might be left for energy reduction? There seems to be a consensus that a lot of the low-hanging fruit in the form of, of lighting projects and simple HVAC scheduling improvements, that a lot of that's been pursued. It, maybe not all of it's been plucked, but a lot of that's been gone after. Near the top of the tree, you have things like deep energy retrofits and renewable energy projects that will undoubtedly have to be part of that strategy, but that's not going to be a solution for every building. We're going to have a lot of existing building stock that we're going to be stuck with, and that's where I really see RCX coming into play as, as being that next generation of low to medium hanging fruit. You just need to know how to find it. So it's, it's not just me with, uh, with this, this conclusion. There's a, there's a number of studies out there. There's a really good one from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs where they looked at several hundred buildings and compiled a lot of the data for some of these RCX projects. And they came out with some pretty impressive numbers, 16% average savings. Many of those went on to achieve more than 30%, depending on their facility type and the level of effort uh, that was undergone. And that, that number on the bottom, the 1.1 year payback, is, is pretty stark when you consider, at the installation level, you know, what's some of the payback that we see on our energy projects. There's pretty immense opportunity there, but it, it, gets, uh, it gets better when you look at some of the other data that came out of some of those reports. So Lawrence Berkeley National Labs also noted different instances of things like occupant uh, productivity and, and, and safety, things like indoor air quality and uh, thermal comfort, taking a, a big leap in many of those cases, and an improved operation and maintenance. And this makes sense when you look at how RCX may be taking some of the band-aids off of what many buildings have to go through and allowing for a, a much more detailed analysis that, that gets to some of the root problems of why a building may be underperforming. So how do we get there? Well, first, uh, I'm going to give a couple examples of what, what RCX looks like in action. So to start with, this is, a, this is a building performance trend. So this is the way that a lot of folks in the RCX industry look at buildings. So it's a time series graph, and you can see here at the bottom that there's a, about a week period here. It's temperature data, and some of you might be familiar with looking at this and may have already guessed that this is economizer temperature data. So the red is return air, the blue is outside air, and then the green is mixed air that's mixing both of that together at the beginning end of the, of the air handler. So there's a number of things that you can tell from looking at this. So, so the first thing that, that might jump out is the red return air on top. Looks like it's hanging on a, on a pretty steady 72 for a um, for an overnight period and also a holiday period. So this type of trend could tell you that there's some scheduling issues that might need to be looked into. 
the blue line in the areas where it hangs really close to the green line is indicating that you're using 100% outside air. And when you're dipping into low temperatures like 50 degrees, that, that's another red flag that there might be some performance issues to, to look into. And I, looking at this data the first time, I had kind of assumed that there might be a broken mixed air damper because it hung on the outside air line so frequently. But there are these little spikes at the beginning of the day. And that's another question that you would go on to do some investigation on is, is why, why are you seeing just those spikes at the beginning of the operation and then only doing fresh air economizing after that? So this type of analysis is almost like having a dialogue with the building. And that's, that's kind of the heart of some of the RCX testing and analysis that's done. And there's really 10 skills that, uh, that I'll go through that allow you to have that type of dialogue and understand what that performance is. So you can order them almost sequentially as, as you would start to finish an RCX effort. And beginning with, you have some off-site prep that you may have to do. There's uh, some, some lighter assessment activities you're going to do when you get on site. There's the deeper testing and analysis investigation. And then there's an execution phase. So the first skill is HVAC fundamentals. And that's, that's definitely the most expansive skill. So there's, there's some basic competencies that you may not need to be specialized in, or you may not need to have an uh, advanced level of understanding. But in order to do RCX, you may need to understand things that we've broken down here, like understanding the nature of HVAC loads and processes, or being able to identify heating and cooling equipment in the field and, and knowing the capabilities there. We also look at pumping systems when we teach this material and how you move load around with those pumping systems and how to optimize those loops. Then going to airside equipment and how we ventilate and condition air for, uh, for the building. And then finally, HVAC controls that kind of ties all that together. So just as an example of how some of that comes together, so here's a diagram of an air handler. So with a little bit of HVAC fundamentals, you can do some kind of light diagnostic work. And I'll kind of just run through how this works so that we can look at some of the performance issues that you might see in the field. So on the top here, you have return air coming from the top right through a return fan. Some of it's going to be exhausted. Some of it's going to be recirculated. You have outside air that you're bringing in for ventilation and, and possibly for conditioning. And then that's going to mix with the recirculation air to be mixed air that will go through your filters, possibly heating and cooling coils, through a supply fan, and then duct it out to the space. So just from what I've told you there, this is the kind of thing that we may be looking at in an RCX effort. And especially we're looking at economizers, because there's some studies out there that indicate that as much as 70% of the economizers out in the field are experience some mode of failure. So just as, as an example here, I'll, uh, I'll let you take a minute and look at the values that you see on the schematic. So the percentages on the left are the economizer dampers. And then the temperatures are the different temperature sensors that your control system is going to see that will drive those dampers to control the flow in the most energy efficient uh, process that it, that, that it may see. So I'll give you a minute and either think to yourself or feel free to chime in if anybody sees any issue with these numbers or can identify some type of assessment issue that uh, you might want to flag for analysis. Okay, great. I see in the chat window that somebody had pointed out that the return damper might be stuck open to some degree. And that's, that's exactly the answer that, that we're looking for here. When you look at the temperatures on the left here, if you have 50 degree outside air coming in and you're supposed to be using 100% outside air, you wouldn't expect to see a 6 degree 
jump in your mixed air. So that's that's an indication that you might have a stuck return air damper that isn't closed all the way, and then that becomes a penalty that your cooling coil is going to have to pick up. So this is an example of an issue that is not going to result in a in a a comfort call or a complaint by the occupants, that their handler is going to do what it needs to do to discharge the correct temperature, but you're going to be causing a lot of unnecessary cooling in the process, and these types of things tend to go on until an effort like this identifies them. So I'll go through really quickly just a few others here. So here's another uh, set of numbers here, and if we had more time, I'd ask you to look for things like this. In the middle here, you see different heating and cooling coil discharge temperatures indicating that there's simultaneous heating and cooling going on. And this, this can happen in the field. Sometimes in a control loop, you may set up a different preheat set point as distinct from the cooling coil discharge set point. And those things may be fighting each other, but if it's not caught during commissioning or if it's some type of control change after the fact, again, this is an issue where your air handler is meeting its its overall set point that it needs to send out to the space. So this isn't necessarily something that's going to be caught by an occupant complaint or uh, a maintenance issue. So here's one more that uh, I think can be common that we see in the field. And I'll just point out that when you look on the left here, and you see the temperature of almost 80 degrees outside, but you see some level of mixing at the return air damper, and the mixed air is cooler than both the return air and what the outside air says, this can be an indication that you have sensor error. And this can occur typically for the outside air sensor, because it's subjected to possibly being in a uh, non-shaded location. So if you have sun coming up on that sensor, that could make your air handler think that you're having higher temperatures outside than you actually are, and it may try to get away from using that free cooling. And again, that's a penalty that your cooling coil is going to have to pay that you otherwise wouldn't need to use any mechanical cooling for. So that's, that's an example of just having some basic HVAC competencies to help you see those types of things in the field. And then those fundamentals are really going to carry through with all the rest of the skills here. So. The second skill is utility analysis, and this is key for prioritizing what you may want to look at in an RCX assessment. So we're probably all used to looking at this type of energy data. So you know, monthly, quarterly, annual, build energy data, gas or electric. And that can be very useful for benchmarking or just identifying some, some flags that uh, we're having issues in the building. But with a little more advanced utility analysis, you can actually develop some drivers of where, where those problems are. So here's another look at some of that same data. And it's a scatter plot where you're looking at the average daily out, outdoor air temperature. And then that's plotted against, on the y-axis, the daily therms that you see at those temperatures. So for every day that you're at, say, 60 degrees, how many therms did you use on that day? And this is about a two-year period. So one of the things that, that should jump out here is that there's two patterns that are emerging in this, in this graph. And that should seem somewhat counterintuitive because you would expect that the colder it gets, the more natural gas that you're going to use for space heating in the building. So this indicates a problem that you wouldn't have otherwise seen just by looking at the billing data. And in this particular case, what we did is looked at the conference room in the center of this building, there's about a 10,000 square foot conference space. And we noticed that it was unoccupied quite a bit of the time, almost uh, about two thirds of the time. So we got the calendar, the meeting calendar for that room from the admin assistant, matched that up and we noticed that the, the no or low occupancy correlated with that top pattern. And what's actually happening here is when the building or when the space was unoccupied, you still had 55 degree conditioned air going into the space, but now there's no load, there's no equipment, there's no people, there's no lights. So you have a thermostat on the wall that's trying to keep 70, 72 degrees, and it's going to trigger some type of reheat in the space to, to meet that thermostat set point. 
So this is an issue where without some type of demand controlled feature to the air handler, having a really unoccupied space actually causes uh, quite a bit of energy usage extra. So once you identify drivers in a, in a, in a process like that, the next skill that you would need to employ would be RCX scoping. So this is where you do an initial walkthrough with the building, something of a basic assessment to flag issues for later analysis. So one example might be this hot water piping system. So th this is a pretty small hot water loop that goes to an air handler coil. You can see a control valve with a bypass on the left. You can see some sensors here in the middle. <clears throat> so with a little closer look here, this would definitely be the kind of thing that you would want to flag and understand what type of performance implications that you see here. So not only do you see some leakage at the pipe, that's most likely caused by some type of temperature difference that different piping components and seals um, are not handling well. But you see a sensor that's actually hanging down from the pipe, which is a, a poor practice. And what we actually found was, in addition to that, when you actually pull the probe out, the probe wasn't the length of the well, and the well wasn't actually immersed into the pipe. Now, this may not be an issue if that sensor is really just used for monitoring, but in this particular case, once we flagged it for scoping and went into more detail later, we found that this is a hot water supply temperature sensor that was actually directly driving the stages on the hot water boil, boiler. So what was happening is because of the water dripping on this well, cooling it, and because of the short probe and the non-immersion well, the sensor was really never seeing the accurate temperature, especially not at first when the boiler fires up. So this sensor was telling the boiler stages to crank up, trying to meet this temperature. And what was actually happening is it kept tripping, and then the maintenance staff upped the lockout on the boiler. So at, when we came and found this boiler, it was set to 250, and it basically turned a hot water boiler into a steam boiler, which has huge maintenance, safety, energy implications. Now for the scoping, there's a, a tool that we use called System Diagrams, and this kind of helps you both in the field and looking at different uh, piping drawings, helps you understand how those systems are put together. So as an example, a little more complex than the hot water loop that we just looked at, this is from a deep energy retrofit project where you have, you have quite a bit going on. You have stratified hot water tanks serving space heat radiator panels, also, there's solar hot water that's running to that tank and a booster boiler for when that solar hot water can't meet load. Also going through those tanks is domestic hot water that's preheated by gray water heat recovery and then going to a domestic hot water storage tank with a recirculation loop. So if I was to ask you if there were any issues with this piping, it would be very difficult to find from this type of schematic. And this was actually the contractor's simplified look at the system. So a better way to do it is to untangle some of these, focus on the key co components, and develop something that looks more like this, which we would call a system diagram. And from this view, it's easier to see that the closed loop system that we're looking at is really more of a conventional single primary dual secondary. And that allowed us to not just do diagnostics in the future on a system like this, but be a good communication tool. So in the design review process, we found these issues, that they were missing pumps, that they, were, they had a control valve in the wrong place and that there was a missing balance valve. And also that they had uh, two pumps on a header with uh, different performance characteristics to those pumps. So it's a very one of those examples where an RCX skill really has reverberations in the other areas of facilities management that we've used in a lot of our design review and scoping processes. The next couple skills are concerned with capturing field data. So that may be performance trends and logging a building, how it operates over time, functional tests to check sequences of operation, and then performing the data analysis from those trending and tests. So we, kinda, we already looked at one trend, but just as another example, this is something that in our practicums we use as a, something of a teaching tool. These are called mystery graphs. So purposefully, we've left off the units on the y-axis, the left side of this graph, and we ask students, in order to help them acclimate to looking at performance trend data, just to try to think about what they might be seeing. So if I gave you these options from A to D, 
and I'll, and I'll give you a minute and feel free to use the chat window if you think you have an idea or I'll pick it up in a minute, but just try to think about what type of data you might be seeing and what you would expect it to do. Okay, yeah, I see a, a couple people are seeing it here. So this is uh, this can really only be, given what uh, what you have here, it can really only be CO2, so D. And you can kind of do a process of elimination that it really can't be temperature data in a sauna, just given the given the units on the left. And it's really not in line with what you would expect supply airflow or lighting power over time to look like on a on a graph. So this is actually CO2 level in a movie theater and you can tell by not just the way that it's the, the pattern and how it doesn't operate binary but it kind of has this analog gradual drop over time but it also seems to when you look at the time units down here you can see you know maybe a, a two hour window where the CO2 spikes drops off when they empty the theater happens a couple times at night and then at about midnight you see a drop off. So th those are kind of helpful tools that we use to to get people used to both how to set up and how to evaluate trends. And you can do that with an existing control system or what can be helpful is these portable data loggers. So there's a number of different pieces of instrumentation that you can use to capture all type of performance metrics, both if you don't have a control system to adequately capture those points or if for some reason you don't trust it. Like there's a sensor that seems to be in a poor area or you, you feel might be subject to accuracy issues. So by contrast, a functional test is looking not necessarily at performance over time, but it's looking at response. So as an example here, a pretty common functional test that you might do during an RCX project is looking at pump performance. So if I walked up to a pump and I, I, I saw the curve that it was that was part of the commissioning, it might be part of the assessment if you want to try to optimize your pumps to know how it's actually operating and how it could operate. So you might go from this to this type of evaluation where you've deadheaded your pump to understand what the actual impeller size is or if it's degradated, looking at your operation condition as you found it, what happens when you open up any balance valves, and then understanding what type of, what type of flow you really want to be at and then what type of optimization strategies might be there, whether it's a VFD or trimming the impeller that's an example of a functional test. And then the test and the performance trend then feed the different calculations that you may do. And this is more typical that we'd see in the energy management industry is, is running your energy savings and then calculating an ROI. So it's common, I think, on the, on the air side to look at the psychrometrics and use some of those standard equations. You want to account for your equipment efficiency, but really also your, your system efficiencies for your, your heating and cooling sides. You want to look at, for any performance changes, your pump energy, your fan energy from those changes. And then to understand when you're changing hours or when you're trying to calculate how many hours may be up for grabs for different ECMs or conservation measures. It's very handy to use bin hours for your location that will tell you how many hours you have in a year at those temperature ranges. And there's, there's pretty standard places to, to get construction costs like RS means, but what's really helpful is just to, to know how good scoping and good data analysis can really drive better cost estimates. And as an example, I'll show you what something that we did with, with break rooms. So we had a building where the design team decided not to use occupancy sensors in the break rooms like they did in the rest of the building. And that may have been a very valid design consideration, but now that we have the building, we can just query the building to find out how it's being used. So you can use something like this light logger here that looks at light usage versus whether the space is occupied. And you can use a tool like this universal translator free software tool 
that can actually take in this 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 data from these portable data loggers and give you some some pretty quick and easy views about how the light's being used versus how occupied the space is. So from this, we were able to get a breakdown of each room, how often the lights were on when the space was not occupied, and then that drives a fairly cut and dry assessment of how much energy you would save from correcting that and compared to your implementation costs, how quickly that's going to pay back. So this is an under two year payback that you don't have to rely on a rule of thumb to say that break rooms save, you know, on the order of 15, 20% savings. This is something that uh, is going to tell you really how that space is being used and if, if this measure makes sense. The last skill is, is implementation. And this is something I'm finding is, is probably the, the most critical part of the, the old RCX efforts and is, is definitely a, a skill that I think is becoming more and more valuable, especially on the, on the DOD side. So it can range from anything about knowing, knowing who and how to change different control sequences in your automation systems. So this is an example where we have these logic blocks driving how an air handler is coming on. And in order to install some optimization sequence so that it's not doing a, a simple one hour warm up every day, but it's complying with ASHRAE 90.1, and looking at some criteria like outside air temperature to determine how early it needs to go on. It's, it's a matter of going from this screen to this screen where you're adding some additional blocks and telling it how to reset that warm up time. So knowing who's going to do that and how to do it and how to test it can be key in the implementation process. Also knowing who to coordinate with. And as an example of that, we had a building where we had quite a bit of exterior lights. So when you turn the lights off, this is essentially what we, what we had to work with. And what we had wanted to do was take the lights from, from that to, to, to this, to basically turn off from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. a lot of the exterior lights being used. And instead of just putting in the time clocks to do that, we coordinated with the safety manager for the base, the security officer, and the building management folks. And we all came to the conclusion that because it was a fenced installation and this building was not near the barracks, we had a curfew and we also still had lighted areas for driving and lights and for pathways, that this, this was a measure that, that made sense and didn't violate any type of army regulation or safety. And so that's an example of a coordination best practice. And it's, it's kind of the same thing on, on human behavior is understanding that, that occupants really play a role in their energy system. So here's an example of a thermostat in a newer building that, that really doesn't have any type of adequate labeling. And we started asking the building management how they use this, this thermostat. You know, what, uh, what happens when you, how do you know when to hit a button and what happens when you do or use that switch at the, at the bottom? And what we found is that they're across the board thermostats weren't being used and the operation and maintenance folks were just being called in when there was a temperature complaint, which is really not a good use of, of any O&M group's time. So what we did was try to kind of gather up what some of those questions and concerns might be, and we put it on a label, which was really just an overlay of the thermostat itself. So in addition to just being a best practice for providing this type of affordance for our occupants, in this case, we were able to actually trim certain zones down so that the heating and cooling equipment wasn't operating past 3 p.m. when they were almost regularly unoccupied, but providing direction on this override button so that they could turn that space back on if they happen to be in the class. So an instance of human behavior actually coming up with measurable savings. So and then there's just the question about how a how a garrison might plan for some of this RCX work. So which buildings are going to get RCX assessments and how that gets budgeted, both time and money, and who's going to perform this work, how much of it's going to be in-house, how much of it's going to be contracted, what tools might we need or might want to have on hand or rented out or required to use for these, uh, these different steps, uh, what type of scopes of work are, are we going to use or might be available, and then what deliverables might we ask from a contractor. So there's a lot of consideration here that's 
I think RCX kind of mandates if it's going to be done effectively, this type of base planning would be effective. And, and to me, it, it really has led me to the conclusion that implementation is probably the most critical skill that we need to have to make sure we're getting the most out of these efforts. So uh, where to go next? So I'm going to briefly go over some RCX resources. And uh, everything here should be linked. So if you, if you click on some of the images when you get these slides, it'll take you to where you can find them. I also have a, a spreadsheet database of about a couple hundred different references and tools. If anybody's interested, I can, I can definitely pass that on. But I'll highlight a couple here. So there's, there's a number that are really good for some, some definitional basics for RCX and elaborations on what some of the benefits are. So I'll, I'll point out this, uh, this LBNL 2009 meta-study that is handy not just in the factors that are developed, average savings seen, average cost per square foot. There's even breakdowns of what different facilities see as far as savings and costs and payback, as well as different size facilities. So there's, there's quite a bit of good data in there from the 700 or so buildings that they looked at. Um, but there's also a section where they talk about what the effect was of having a detailed scope of work had on the overall savings. So to look at as a proxy for comprehensiveness of scope, they looked at the number of steps that was in that scope of work and how there was a direct correlation to improve savings. So the conclusion that LBNL came to is that the more comprehensive you make your scope, you can see between two to five times the savings. But then that leads to making sure that you have good implementation guides, that you're covering that level of detail. So there's a number out there as well, more than, more than I can list in, in a few slides. Um, there's a few highlighted here, but I think the best one out there right now is a guideline from ASHRAE that came out last year. It's the first guideline dedicated specifically to existing buildings commissioning, rather than making that a subset of the commissioning guideline. And one of the things they do is define RCX by six different phases. So planning, understanding at a campus level, how you may want to approach RCX, who's going to do it, what the schedules are, what buildings to look at, you know, what, what tools and methods and maybe sequences or ECMs you want to try to target. The assessment phase, which would be what the energy manager might do according to section 432 of ESA 2007, that initial look at the building. A deeper dive with the investigation, the implementation actually making the changes, which might be from a number of different parties, depending on the, uh, the, the cost and type of work being done. Uh, handoff would kind of be paired with that, handoff to the occupants and the building management, and then a, an ongoing commissioning effort where you're repeatedly looking back or consistently looking back at that data performance to make sure there's no slippage. So I think these, these phases are particularly valuable, especially in the context of USACE operations because there's, there's essentially a task order that could be accomplished out of each of these, all the way from the planning to the, to, to the ongoing. So it's definitely worth something considering about how to support, um, you know, as a district or as a contracting agency or as a project manager, how USACE may be able to support installations in this work. And one of the things that uh, we're trying to get in development is a standard scope of work that'll at least cover some of those phases so that there's uh, something for IMCOM and USACE that we can put out that's going to cover some of the comprehensiveness that, that LBNL talks about to get to the savings that we know RCX is capable of. There's other, uh, other tools out there, some process, some technical. Uh, I would point to the California Commissioning Collaborative. Uh, they have a pretty extensive library of uh, resources and write-ups. There's some HVAC gurus out there, like uh, David Sellers is one that has a blog that covers a lot of the field lessons learned that he's seen over the years. Uh, on the bottom left, there's a FT Guide is a website by PECI that has a number of functional test templates that you may want to use for different systems to supplement what you might see in the UFGS for commissioning of HVAC systems. And then there's some places that you can get tools. So there's a we had used a local utility, but also there's a, an effort at CERL to demonstrate being a repository for some of these energy audit and RCX tools. And if anybody's interested, I can get you in contact with the principal on that, Dr. Swanson, who's trying to get together some of those tools to help support the districts and the installations. 
There's also a uh, formal training that, that that's out there for folks that want to be more specialized in RCX. And what I'm going to do now is is if his audio is working, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague that I worked with for a number of years at uh, Presidio, the energy manager uh, for the garrison there, who was the primary organizer for the RCX practicums that's going to be going into its third year and is a, uh, a week-long effort that we did to help teach some of this material while we're performing our RCX mandated assessments. So with that, I'll, it, I'll hopefully his audio is working, and I'll introduce uh, Jay Tully, the energy manager for Presidio Monterey. Uh, Jay, mute, mute your, your uh, speakers. We don't get any feedback. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Great. Uh, good presentation by Brian. Um, nice to see a lot of people online. Um, yeah, so there's a there's a photo here from the first practicum that we did at Presidio uh, back in 2014. I see Brian and I there in the middle. A couple of other people I've seen on on the call even. Uh, but uh, what we realized going through this uh, this year-long course that we did in PG&E was just how important it was to get real field experience. Um, and so we wanted to get a couple things done. We wanted to go through the process of, of retro-commissioning another building on Presidio, um, but use it as a hands-on laboratory for other energy managers to, to check this out. And so, um, you know, obviously you can't do in a week what you can do in a year, but we really tried to expose um, participants to both the, um, the, the field lessons, but also with some of the, the classroom exercises. Um, you know, the feedback we got actually was that there was really more of a demand for more field exercise. So the follow-on year, uh, 2015, we um, prepared uh, quite a few months of, of classes, um, about, about 10 classes or so that were done online. And then during the week uh, that the students came out, it was really field-based. And um, we really think that's, that's the way to go forward on this. So uh, obviously, you know, losing Brian from Presidio is um, a big loss but it's, it's for Presidio, but it's a, I think it's a huge gain for the Army as a whole. Because if we can get some of these training classes developed, through Searle, um, we think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to um, to really get get some of that instruction out there. Um, you know, not coming from a mechanical degree program, um, going through this stuff for me was was just huge in my development as an energy manager. Um, so I really hope that uh, that uh, the more energy managers can go through this. Um, to the next slide, if you if you want, Brian. Okay, so those are yours. So I'm really not going to speak um, speak too much more. What what I'm hoping is that if there are energy managers who are interested in doing this again, we are going to try to have at least one more practicum at the Presidio. Um, we're probably planning on either either late fall, probably more likely in the spring. Um, but what I'd really love to see is is a community of energy managers who are interested in this. Um, maybe we can use the energy exchange as a forum to start talking about this stuff. Um, um, so from there, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to Brian. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to wrap up and open it up for, for questions. I know we, we covered quite a bit there, but just a kind of quick quick word on, on takeaways there is that I know we had a lot of uh, varied backgrounds on the webinar here, but the way I see it is that we all we all touch DoD facilities in, in, in some some way or another, wh whether that's you know Jay directly as an energy manager, or if we're on the policy side, or you know for a project engineer or a PM, you know there's there, there's quite a bit of influence I think we all have on the energy efficiency and performance of our buildings, and um, I, I hope I've made the case that RCX really needs support from, from all these different levels for how varied the skills are that you need to, to be able to, to do this right. 
Okay, uh, if, so, if I could chime in uh, for a second, Brian, I wanted to point out to people that there's a download button in the lower left. Uh, since you did have those icons that were web linked, um, if you if people see that uh, down arrow with the little bracket uh, icon, uh, they can click on that and they can download the presentation uh, so that they have the slides and they can access uh, not just the links that you had in your presentation, but also uh, the uh, the link to the uh, sustain sustainability and energy website as well as the um, email address for the quizzes. Um, folks, if you would, uh, type in your questions in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, I'll, I will read the questions aloud for the sake of the recording, uh, and also I'll consolidate re redundant ones and maybe skip over some that uh, we can get to uh, to kind of keep things moving. Um, Patricia asks, uh, can you talk about the next webinar that you'll be giving in July? Is that a repeat of this, or is that a different one? No, and uh, thanks, Patricia. I'd, I'd wanted to give a little preview here, and I felt that there was too much to cover just in the talking about the skills and, and what we've seen in the field. But I'm slated right now for July, and, and Patricia, you'd have to remind, remind me about the dates. But uh, there's going to be another sustainability webinar specifically on a tool that, that I've been in the process of developing called RCX University. And what we had tried to do is take a lot of the presentation material and a lot of the, the the testing and exercise material that we had developed for those RCX practicums and essentially make a website out of that, make, make some type of user-friendly interface where somebody could go self-paced on their own time, get exposure to these topics, and uh, possibly as a, as a companion to coming to the field. Like Jay said, we, we found that a lot of folks could be a bit overwhelmed by trying to get the lecture material needed to go into the field. And it, it's always better, I think, to, you know, some of these HVAC gurus and commissioning authorities that, that we had brought in to help teach the class, their time is better spent in the field teaching these things. And almost in like a flipped classroom or blended classroom uh, method, uh, there, there's an opportunity to get some short videos up and get some training material on a website. And that's what I'm going to be overviewing is the status of that on July 26th. Thanks, Patricia. Uh, I had one question. Um, now I'm an architect, not a mechanical engineer. Um, but on on your uh, pop quiz segment, uh, where we had the cooling mode as well as the heating mode running simultaneously in the ductwork, um, how do we tell, especially for novices like me, uh, if that is an error or if that's uh, an intentional humidity management uh, kind of technique, where you're cooling the water out of the air and reheating it back up or something like that? Yeah, that's that, and that's a great question. And there's there's actually systems that, by design, do a fair amount of simultaneous heating and cooling. Some of the older systems, like dual duct systems or multi-zone systems, to some degree you may be stuck with that, and you may want to optimize it. But it, it's a really great question, and I think the best answer I can give you is until you do a deeper dive, you may not know how much of that you're stuck with or, or how much, if any of it, is, is actually call for a performance change, but the the biggest thing I'd get across is that things like that should at least be red flags. So in the in the scoping assessment, the RCX scoping portion that an energy manager is going to do, that's an area where you definitely want to make a note for, for further investigation on to find out if that is a control system error or if those set points can be optimized. I think more than likely you're going to see that 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 Systems are set up where they may be fighting each other, and they just go unnoticed. But it, it's a great question that there's a scoping portion separate from the a deeper investigation. Okay, and um, another thing, now people, we have the chat box down there. Feel free to type in some questions. Uh, but uh, we have a few minutes left, seven minutes left um, while we're waiting. Uh, Brian. You've done a lot of these, I assume, and uh, what what could you tell us about the um, the oddest pattern or thing that you have identified that you really would not have expected? Thing you'll tell your grandchildren about? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't even get my wife to listen to some of these stories. She's not a uh, in, an engineer nerd like I am, so she's not as excited by uh, these stories as much. I'm sure my grandkids will be the same, but. Um, um, I, I would say there's uh, that 
that hot water boiler that we were turning into a steam boiler would probably be up there because that that was an instance where this had been going on for some time and it was a, a very odd combination of the sensor being in a poor place that was tied directly to operating the boiler and telling it whether or not to to heat up the water more and it was it was just this odd loop that uh was this vicious cycle that that was causing the the water the hot water to be instead of 160 or 180 up to 250 or 260 and to witness that firsthand and to hear that firsthand was uh was was quite shocking but I find there's a lot of issues like that, that even when you're, even with folks that have done this, you know, I've, I've been doing this for maybe five years, but folks that have done this for a lifetime, almost every building can be, there, there can be some mystery that needs to be solved. So it's, there's, there, there's never, never a dull moment. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Uh, there's, um, yeah, actually getting over the boiling point that could have had catastrophic impact if, uh, if things were uh, not built to the where they this, where they were, um, Patricia has posted in the uh, public area down there, uh, comment area, the the website to the uh, the retro commissioning um, or the commissioning uh, website. Uh, we mentioned the uh, sustainability site. There's sub pages to that. Um, on what we call that the Mercy site because it starts with MRSI, um, so people can check that out as well. Um, not seeing any more questions coming in. Uh, if there's anything you want to add, um, otherwise I'll leave it up uh, for people to download the presentation. Uh, that might take a while. And uh, I will. Um, do, you have, do you have anything more you want to say, Brian? Um, no, I would just just add that uh, if it seems like the links aren't working, because I, I think what I'm actually using is a is a PDF of the PowerPoint, so I'm not oh. sure if the links uh, transfer through. So Eric, I can get you the PowerPoint slides. I, I hope that they're helpful, and I've I've made a uh, an impression on the how needed this this area is in facilities management. And uh, any questions, um, please feel free to contact me. Okay. There's also the commissioning at usace.army.mil. Um, we can take those links if you send us those links. We can, or maybe they're already out there. Uh, we can put them on that commissioning website. Um, and I'm not sure. Maybe we can host the uh, the files out there too. Uh, this is being recorded. I will um, process the recording once it's available. It usually takes a couple weeks uh, for the DCS system uh, to do whatever magic it does on the recording file, uh, and then I'll edit it and post it on our unlisted YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link to that channel on the on the uh, sustainability and energy website as well, uh, so you can watch this and uh, the prior uh, webinars that we've had. Most of them, there's still some missing that we're trying to work out. Uh, from the transition from DCO to DCS. Uh, but um, those could be good refreshers for those of you wanting to take your quizzes and get your CEUs. Uh, with that, I will turn off the, the recording and uh, say good afternoon to everybody and, uh, and have a nice day. I will leave the window up again so that people can make those downloads. And uh, there's some people chiming in things here. Uh, okay, some people have some nice comments. Oh, okay. They tested the Mercy link. Double clicking the link in the PDF in the PDF will launch the website. Uh, okay, so so uh, that works. The PDF works. Uh, all right, Brian. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.